I pledge allegiance to the Christian flag and to the Savior for whose kingdom it stands. One Savior who's coming again with life and liberty to all who believe. And I remember being all of eight, nine, and ten, muttering under my breath, for whose kingdom it stands, which has already come, to all who believe and are baptized. I remember saying that while I was, when I was a kid and, and, and whenever I was doing that, I was going to make sure I got that right. Now, I imagine for many in this room, it's this one line that has kind of uh, made it difficult to think of this prayer as the model prayer to lead wherever you are every Sunday at church. This line has caused some difficulty, and I get it. There are some religious groups that make a point to say the kingdom has not come yet. Years ago, a long time ago, there was even a, someone who said that Jesus meant to set up a kingdom, but he wasn't able to, so he set up the church as an afterthought. Now, I don't actually know anyone who thinks that now, but I've, I still hear that said sometimes, like, you know, I think people believe that somebody a long time ago said that, which is wrong. Now, I want us to think about this in, in four ways. I'm going to ask four questions. I'm going to give you the best four answers I know, and then I'm going to try to explain it. So save your tomatoes until I'm done with the sermon if you don't like the answers. All right. What is the kingdom? Has it come yet? How is it related to church, and should we be praying this prayer? Okay, I'm going to break all protocol and tell you what four answers I want to try to give you tonight. What is the kingdom? The kingdom is the sovereign rule and reign of God. Has it come yet? Yes, there's a sense in which the kingdom has come, and there's also a sense in which we wait for it. How is it related to church? At its best, the church participates in the kingdom, but it's not the same thing. Last, should we be praying this prayer? Yes, we should absolutely be praying this prayer. Let me see if I can make that case. Let's start with this, the, 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 all three words. We'll do one at a time. Your kingdom come. Your is really important. There are lots of kingdoms. Uh, in the Old Testament, it was the most common phrase. You don't hear that much these days, uh, except maybe at Disney World, when you're talking about somebody coming from a kingdom, right? A magic kingdom. But back then, everybody had a kingdom. And so the idea was, whose, kingdoms, whose kingdom is better? And whenever they would talk about God's kingdom, they would talk about it as greater than all. And so in Psalm 145, verses 11 through 13, if you'll turn there, Psalm 145, 11 through 13, the text says, They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and tell of your power to make known to the children of man your mighty deeds and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. For your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures throughout all generations. The idea is you look at the kingdoms of the world and they either have bad leaders or pretty good leaders, but nobody like God. And they may last a short time or a long time, but nothing like God's. God's kingdom, everlasting, God's rule, complete and perfect. This idea of your is meant to imply a superl superlative, one that we're, uh, can't compare to anything else. In Luke 23 and verse 42, you remember there were two other people on crosses that day, and one of them who realizes that he doesn't belong in the same boat as Jesus, turns to Jesus and says, remember me when you come into what? Your kingdom. A recognition that this kingdom, as greater than anybody else's, lasts longer, perfect rule, belongs to Jesus Christ. And Hebrews says that too. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 8, it says, To which angel did he ever say what he says to the Son? To the Son, he says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. Righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. So we're talking about a power like nothing else that extends farther than anything else. We call it God's kingdom, but I want you to notice that that which belongs to God has been given to the Son. Number two, 
kingdom. When you think of kingdom, you tend to think of a king. You tend to think of land, territory. You tend to think of law, and you tend to think of a people. It's what comes to mind when you think of a kingdom. King, territory, law, and people. But the New Testament wants to add that the kingdom of God is also noticed by character. Character. When you hear king, law, territory, people, it sounds like form. I want to make sure that we fill the form with content. Listen to the way the New Testament emphasizes God's kingdom compared to anything else. Romans 14 and verse 17. The kingdom of God is not meat and drink. Kingdom of God is not about what's in it for you or about partying. The kingdom of God is righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit, the deepest qualities of life. 1 Corinthians 4 and verse 20, the kingdom of God does not consist in talk, but in power. Do you see how the language here is? It's not like any other kingdom. It lasts longer, it's better in its reign, it's deeper in its focus, and it reaches the most important things. Your kingdom come. In Mark 15 and verse 43, Jesus has died and something has to happen to his body. And in Mark, 14, uh, Mark 15, the text says that Joseph of Arimathea asked if he could take the body of Jesus and put the body in his own tomb. But it's interesting what Mark says about Joseph of Arimathea. He too was waiting for the kingdom. That's language of someone who's longing for God's rule and reign to be clearly manifest. And so in Acts chapter 1, it shouldn't surprise us that as Jesus, who's rose from the dead and is about to go up back up to God, he's surrounded by people who are wondering the same thing. And they say, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? It's interesting that Jesus doesn't answer yes or no. What he says is, it's not for me to tell you the times and seasons God has in mind, but wait here until you are imbued with power from on high. And in Acts 2, we know that the Holy Spirit descended. We know that God's power was there. We know that prophecies were fulfilled. We know that God started something beautiful and new. There's no doubt about any of that. I want you to hear how the New Testament speaks of kingdom in three ways, and then I'm going to try to make sense of it. Past, present, and future. There's something here to upset every position you've ever heard. Here's the first one. Here are verses that make me think that you can say, yes, the kingdom has come. In Mark chapter 9 and verse 1, also Luke 9 verse 27, Jesus says, there are some people standing here who will not taste death until they see the, the kingdom come with power. Now, there's lots of positions on what he's talking about, but the most natural reading to me is that he's saying there are literally people who are literally standing here who are going to see something before they actually die that you could call the kingdom of God. In Colossians 1 and verse 13, Paul is using past tense language and he says, God has rescued us from the kingdom of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of light. Do you hear that language? It's already happened and we're in it. Colossians 4 verse 11, he's greeting fellow soldiers of the faith and he speaks of those who are workers in or for the kingdom of God. In 1 Corinthians 15, verse 24, Paul is trying to talk about what's going to happen at the end, and he says, and at the end, the Son will deliver the kingdom back to God. Well, that doesn't sound like something that shows up at the end. It sounds like something that's already here that gives back to the Father in the end. So you hear that language? That maybe it's already come. In Revelation chapter 1, in verse 6, and in verse 9, the author of Revelation begins the book, by saying, he has made us 
a kingdom of priests. And in Revelation 1 and verse 9, John says, I am John, your brother, in tribulation and in the kingdom. Okay, I've just given you a bunch of verses that I think are important. When someone says to you, there's no sense in which the kingdom has already come, I can't say that because these verses seem to me to say the kingdom has come. But then you have some verses that are in the present tense, but they're not clear. Acts chapter 8 and verse 12 says, They went everywhere preaching about the kingdom, and when people heard it, they were baptized. Does that mean that kingdom's the same thing as church, and they were baptized to enter the church? Could be. Could be. Does it mean in view of a coming kingdom, you should belong to the church now? Could be. In 1 Thessalonians 2 and verse 12, the author says, God has called you, actually it's present tense, God calls you into his own kingdom. Does that mean he's calling you into the church which is his kingdom? Could be. In 2 Thessalonians 1 and verse 5, it says, live a life worthy of the kingdom of God. Does that mean worthy of the kingdom you're in? I see it that way. Or could it mean worthy of the kingdom that's coming to you? You see how it's not clear. Hebrews 12, verse 28, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom. Does that mean grateful for one we have received, one we are receiving, or one we will receive? It's not clear. Now I want to show you some verses that sound to me like something future. In Matthew chapter 20, in verse 21, There are some people who came to Jesus, and the whole point of the story is don't be like them. But they want to talk about how special they'll they'll be. And they say, Lord, can we sit on your right and left hand in your kingdom? And Jesus says, that's not mine to give. That's up to the Father. It's hard for me to square that idea with something right now in the church that you can describe as the right and left hand of God. It sounds to me like something that you expect to be when we see him face to face on his throne. Luke 13, verses 28 through 29, it says that there are people who will come from the east and the west and they'll recline in the kingdom of God. That could be a metaphor for Jews and Gentiles in the church, absolutely. It could also be the kind of thing talked about in Revelation where it says they're in the throne room of God. You have people from every tribe and every tongue and every nation. In Acts 14 and verse 22, this is interesting. The person preaching is preaching not to lost people, but to disciples. And it says, he told the disciples that with much tribulation, we must enter the kingdom of God. Well, what does that mean? You tell people who are already disciples of Jesus, already in the church, that through tribulation we must enter the kingdom of God. Hold on to that thought. 1 Corinthians 6 and Galatians 5. Don't you know those who live unrighteous lives will not inherit, what? The kingdom of God. Not the kind of language you usually use for something one already possesses. 1 Corinthians 15, 50, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. James 2 and verse 5, we are heirs of the kingdom. Raise your hand if you're an heir to something. Just curious. Besides, not spiritual, but just like, you know, you, uh, one day something will be yours. Okay, no heirs. All right, um, normally an heir is somebody who's waiting to receive something. And then I think the passage most clear about the future is 2 Timothy 4 and verse 1, in which it says, in view of his coming and his kingdom, we preach the word. What do you do with a New Testament text that seems to make it sound as if the kingdom has come, the kingdom is coming, and we're waiting for a kingdom? The best thing I can do with it is to remind us of the definition of, of kingdom that I've, uh, I've, I've been taught. The kingdom is God's kingly rule. Ideally, a kingdom has a king, a law, a people, and a territory. But you and I know that the truth 
of most any kingdom is more complicated than that. I'm going to give you an illustration, a fable, really. My favorite Disney cartoon ever is uh, The Sword in the Stone. But my second favorite cartoon ever is Robin Hood, the one with the fox and the bear, because that's more true to history. So what I love about that is you remember Prince John is sitting on the throne, but everybody knows you're not, it's not really your throne. It belongs to King Richard the Lionheart, who's gone off somewhere. Some stories say he's off on a crusade. Some say he was uh, pushed away and exiled. Let's just go with the story here. Imagine Richard the Lionheart is king of all England, and England owns territories besides its own island. While he's in exile, is he king? Technically, yes, he is. But someone else is ruling in his place on the throne back home. Shouldn't be, but he is. I mean, he's, he's a hissing snake. He shouldn't be there. And people don't recognize him the King Richard, as king in some places, which means they don't allow him to exercise his kingship. But there's a band of followers very close to him, and they do. And wherever he goes, they go. And whatever he wants to be done, they do, because he's king. In fact, it's because he's king of all England, but they recognize it. Is he only king to that small group? No, not exactly. He's king of all England. But in certain times, it may be the only place where you see his kingdom at work because it's the only place where he is and his will is being done. The goal is to restore the throne and for all people in the territories to acknowledge it so that his will can be done in all the region. So here's the way I want to apply that fable to this story. Does God have a people Yes, of course. Of course he does. And we are so grateful to know that we are people of God. But every time that we try to draw a line around his people in the scriptures, we also see God doing something outside that circle, reminding us that while he has a people, he also has a love for all people because all people are made in his image. Does he have a territory? Yes, he does. The church is meant to be where God exercises his rule. Think about the powerful language about the church in the book of Ephesians and Colossians. He has been made head over all things, the next line is powerful, for the church, which is his body. That's powerful. The church is supposed to be the territory of his reign. It's where he exercises his rule. But all through the New Testament, God answers prayers by people that aren't in the church yet. He raises up kings of pagan countries. He does mighty works outside the circle. And the apostles say, who are they? We should stop them. And Jesus says, no, don't stop them. In other words, I work where I work. And in Revelation 2 and 3, he even sometimes goes inside the circle. And he says to some churches, you think you're a church, but you're not. You're dead. I'm going to take my candlestick away. A constant reminder that while God has called a people and wants to exercise his power through those people as the lines of his territory, he is sovereign over all. So if you want another phrase to describe what it means for God's kingdom to come, I'm going to cut to the chase and you're going to think, well, you just wasted 20 minutes here to tell me this. In Proverbs... Sometimes you can say the same thing in two different ways, and it's called parallelism. You'll see in a proverb, it'll say something like, a wise son makes a glad father and is the joy of his mother. Well, it also works the other way around. It's trying to say the same thing in a slightly different way. Most commentaries say that what's going on here in this sermon, in this this prayer of Jesus, is Hebrew parallelism. Your kingdom come is said again in a different way. Your will be done on earth just as it is in heaven. Here's my view. The kingdom is wherever the king is. It's always near. And as we approach the king, we approach the kingdom. That's how you can be in it. You can be working for it. 
and you can also be waiting for it. It can be both present and coming at the same time because there's still gonna be a day that we're waiting for when God makes everything right, when everyone will bow their knee and recognize who really is Lord. And in that moment, in that day, what is true now will be recognized as true by others. Is the church the kingdom? We ought to be kingdom people. You ought to recognize God's rule and reign in his church. But Psalm, one, uh, Psalm uh, 47 says over and over again, God is king over all the earth. And that's still true. His reach is farther than what I can see. His call is wider than I'm aware of. And at the same time, it should be true where the church is, the kingdom is. The church should be the visible manifestation of the kingdom of God. I think people who don't elevate the church high enough need to hear that again. Where the church is, the kingdom is. On the other hand, we need to ask ourselves the hard question. Is the church willing to be where the kingdom is? Recognizing where God's at work. When we pray, thy kingdom come, that is not a denial of the reality of the present kingdom. It is not a failure to exalt the church for which Christ gave his life. We're in the kingdom. You and I are in the kingdom. But we want more of his kingly rule in our own lives. We want his kingly rule to invade our neighbor's lives. We want our cities and our nations and our world to recognize his lordship. And we want him to come in fullness. So praying thy kingdom come is the same as praying your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's the same as praying come into my life more fully. It's the same as praying Lord come quickly. Can we still pray it? I believe not only can we, we should. We should pray for God's kingly rule to be seen and present everywhere for him to make an impact in our lives and to continue to make more. If that phrase bothers you and you can't let those words leave your lips, if you pray, thy will be done on earth just as it is in heaven, you're saying the same thing and I can live with that. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We praise your name. We thank you for the model prayer. We ask you to give us a love for your church, a recognition that we are kingdom people, that you are our king and that we're in your kingdom. And Father, we ask that you'll give us eyes to see your work wherever that is, to recognize that you're king over all the earth. Help us, Father, to make that known in every place. Father, let us be your hands and feet as we announce to the world that you are king of heaven and earth. Father, let that truth sink down deep into our ears. Let our neighbors see it. Let our country see it. Let our world see it. And Father, may your will be done on earth just as it is in heaven. Let us model what that looks like as we wait for the day when you come back to make everything right. In Jesus' name, amen. Or shall be-